Okay, so we're gonna be talking about after the hack ended, uh, getting into hunting, so the initial stages of training for that, actually hunting, and then the housing that I used for Giselle. So once the hack ended during the day, Giselle would spend uh, her time in a weathering area. I had a, an area on the farm on a, on a pathway uh, near the main barn, and it was a 50-foot run line that was enclosed, and she was attached to the run line. So, and had a perch on either end. And this allowed her to get exercise during the day and also be exposed to everything that was happening on the farm with tractors driving by her and horses and people and remain uh, exposed to all these different stimulus. And so that was really helpful when, uh, when we were in this transition stage. And I ended up keeping her in this weathering area for almost her entire first season, which was really helpful in keeping her tame and used to that kind of commotion going on and she would see those things when we were out hunting because of the nature of the fields we were hunting in. So it was really helpful to have that. So once the hack ended, instead of in the morning cutting her loose in the backyard and giving her you know free reign of the farm, I would take her to her weathering yard with this 50 foot run line and put her there for the day. And once the day ended, I would go and pick her up. I would take her home get her weighed, figure out her uh, food and weigh it out for the, for the evening's hunt and training and uh, put on her transmitter and equipment. Put her in her crate and then drive out to the field. Once I got to the field, I would set up her remote controlled car with the rabbit lure on it. I'd go hide it in some bushes and then I'd take her out and I would start hunting basically. So the training, once the hack was over, was was sort of continuing the training that I was doing during the hack, which was taking her out to different hunting fields that I'm actually gonna be hunting in later and simulating hunts using the RC car. And so initially after a couple minutes of walking around and hitting bushes, I would make the, the RC car drive and drag the lure and let her catch it. And we do a couple training sessions of that. And then I would elongate the amount of time in between the, the car chases or the rabbit lure chases. And so, you know, in the beginning, it was one minute and then two minutes and then five minutes and then 10 minutes. And so eventually we're out in the field for up to 45 minutes or an hour just training, uh, but walking around and, you know, hitting bushes and kicking bushes and just getting her used to all that kind of commotion. And eventually that one of those training sessions, a rabbit ran and she caught it and then she was entered and she was hunting. And so I kept taking the remote controlled car out with me so I could get her exercise initially. And after she caught a couple rabbits, I stopped taking out the remote controlled car. I didn't need it anymore. And I think after three or four rabbits, I stopped using the RC car and the dragged rabbit lure and she was hunting. We were hunting, we were off and running. So during those early stages and during her first season, um, if she didn't sit the fist, I didn't hold her jesses and I didn't hold her back. And my theory behind that is um, by allowing them freedom, you can actually train them a little bit better. And if there's something that scares them and you're holding them, it can have a stronger effect on them mentally. And by being able to fly away from whatever they're afraid of, they can get over a little bit quicker because they're putting some distance between themselves and whatever scared them. So during her first season and during the training uh, in, in the initial stages of hunting, I never held her jesses. I tried to, to pick hunting fields that didn't have a lot of trees in them. Not everyone would be able to do that, but I have a lot of hunting fields out here in Southern California where there's just a lot of chaparral and bushes. And so if she did fly over to a bush, I could just go pick her up off the bush and continue hunting. If I wasn't able to go pick her up, then I would call her to a tidbit that I threw on the floor, or I'd call her to the lure. I would never call her to the fist for food, not in the first season. I started doing that from the second season onwards where I'd call her directly to the fist, but initially I would call her to a tidbit and throw the tidbit on the floor or call her to the lure uh, and then pick her up off the lure. I wanted to avoid any potential opportunities for aggression and because I hand fed her from day one, I didn't wanna also feed her on the glove. I wanted the glove to have a positive association with hunting. So, you know, everything good happens when she's sitting on the glove, but I didn't wanna also feed her on the glove. I just wanted that to be a hunting perch. So uh, it, was, it was fairly simple to get her hunting once the hack was over in that format where I was training in my hunting fields and simulating a hunt with the RC car and the dragged rabbit lure. And eventually she caught a rabbit. And when she caught her first rabbits, I didn't crop her up. 
I gave her the rest of her day's rations and, and we went home, but I didn't crop her up because I wanted to be able to hunt with her the very next day. And I didn't want to change things up and set myself back and then take a couple days off. And I think part of my success with her is that I hunted or trained with her every single day in her first season. So once she got turned on to rabbits, I, I was hunting rabbits every day. And if I couldn't hunt with her, then I would do a training session with a remote controlled car in the drag lure, uh, or I would do restrained pursuits uh, you know, at the house in the yard if the weather wasn't cooperating. But I did something with her every single day. She never got paid for free. She always had to work for food and she was always working away from me for food. Um, in these initial stages, you know, I didn't hood her. I still don't hood her. I didn't want to mess with that. And, and I use a giant hood or a crate to transport her. And so sometimes after eating or after feeding up, after catching a rabbit, she would still be a little antsy. And so I'd save some tidbits. And as I was walking back to my car, I would tie her to the glove and I would throw a tidbit out and do restrained pursuits on the way back to my, my truck. Um, and so there are a couple things that I had to adjust and, and figure out on the fly. At one point I dropped her weight a little bit too low and she was showing signs of being sticky footed on the glove and so I had to bring her weight back up and then readjust. But she turned on to rabbits really easily. And once she was doing that consistently, then I started going after crow and duck. And with crows, what I ended up doing was getting a game bird launcher and getting some black pigeons. And I uh, set up a scenario where she, just the same thing with rabbits, where I hid the RC car and the rabbit lure behind some bushes and went and kicked the bushes. I set up the same type of, ex type of experience um, that she would be hunting with crows. And I launched a couple of pigeons and she caught the pigeons, no problem, no weight drop necessary. Once I started exposing her to crows, I ended up dropping her weight a little bit just to get that edge, but not too much. And she turned on to them very easily and caught quite a few crows in her first season. And then same thing with ducks. When I turned her on to duck hunting, I used the game bird launcher and I just used a couple pigeons. And, and out here, I'm mostly hunting ducks um, that are in ditches. And so I set up the game bird launcher in the ditch and I, I set up three or four scenarios with pigeons uh, simulating a duck hunt. And again, same thing with the ducks. When I actually went and started duck hunting, I dropped her weight just a little bit just to get that drive. And she was successful and, and she had no problems um, turning on to feathered game, the crow, and the crows and the ducks. And the first couple ducks were very easy slips, uh, but I wanted to build her confidence. And then later on, they were more and more difficult. So she hunted fur and feather in her first season I had real no real issues um, having her transition from one to the other. Luckily, I know for some people that can be tricky, uh, but I also never let her get really wed to rabbits before I moved on to feathered game. And uh, she caught in her first season ground squirrels, not on purpose, uh, rabbits, quail, crow, and duck. And um, then I started pursuing in her second and later seasons jackrabbit, tried for pheasants. She, she chased a couple, but I never really had um, any luck with that. I wasn't pursuing them very hard. But she caught black-tailed jackrabbit and white-tailed jackrabbit in Wyoming, which are much larger, and cotton-tail tree squirrel, ground squirrel, quail, crows, ducks. Um, so she's pretty well-rounded. She ended up being a great, a great bird, a great goshawk. She's not vocal in the field at all, um, but she is vocal in the muse at home during the hunting season. When it comes to housing, in the uh, first season, I kept Giselle in a muse and I kept her on a run line, just like I did during the day when I was at work and I took her to her weathering area at work on the 50 foot enclosed run line. I kept her on a run line in the muse at home also. And the muse at, at the house is a 10 foot by 10 foot dog kennel um, with an aluminum roof, pea gravel floor, and, and then um, fake grass on top of that or AstroTurf, but I use fake grass, I like it a little bit better. And the reason why I went with this setup was I, I didn't wanna have solid walls and a muse because out here where I am in Southern California, heat is, is the biggest issue. And Asper was something I was really worried about. So I wanted a lot of airflow and it doesn't really get to freezing here. There's a, maybe 12 to 15 nights a year where it drops to freezing for a couple hours, but it's never freezing temperatures during the day. 
so it's just not that cold, so I don't need to worry about keeping her warm. I only needed to worry about keeping her cool and keeping her from getting asper. And fortunately, uh, she also was exposed to West Nile, and she almost died, actually, uh, not too long ago, unfortunately, but she seems to be making a mostly full recovery. She's having, having some feather pinching issues, and I think I'm going to make a quick video about that and explain what happened, but right now she seems okay. But my biggest concern, uh, other than mosquitoes now, uh, at the time was asper and heat. And so I wanted a really free-flowing muse, and so by keeping her on a run line, I could use just normal dog kennel wire walls and have a lot of airflow there. And I, and I kept her tied to the run line in the first season. That also helped to avoid aggression. And she wasn't, she was vocal in the muse in her first season, but uh, during the off season, she's not vocal. During our hunting season, she's a little, a little vocal in the muse, but it's, it's not unbearable. It's not really that bad. And she's never vocal in the field, which is really helpful. So um, first season kept her attached to the run line. This helped avoid any aggression because she was tied down and I could just go pick her up. Uh, but in subsequent seasons, when she was free lofted in there, what I did was I trained her to fly to her bow perch for food. So during the hunting seasons, when she's free lofted, I'm not feeding her in the muse. I go in there and I pick her up and, you know, she's free lofted. She steps on the glove. I grab her Jesses. We go outside. I weigh her. I put her in the crate and I make her food. We go from there. Uh, during the off season, during the molt, I trained her to fly to the bow perch in order to get paid. And that way she learned not to fly at me when I was in the muse. And so I've never really had to deal with aggression with her in the muse. And, you know, the five years I've had her really, um, even when I tried to breed her and she was raising a baby, zero aggression in the muse. Again, a pretty quiet bird, a little bit vocal at home in the muse during hunting season, not vocal at all in the fields and uh, not vocal at all during the molt. So it's been an interesting uh, method of housing, but it's been very successful for me uh, using the 50-foot run line weathering area at work. That, that only lasted the first two seasons, and then that area, um, we had to put some things there, plant some things there, so I couldn't keep her there anymore. And so I've been keeping her in her muse every day ever since. Uh, but again, I think the success that I had and the fact that she hasn't really shown aggression and that she's been a good bird that has caught a lot of different game is because in her first season, I really laid down the foundation and we hunted and trained every single day and I never called her to the glove. And I, I tried to avoid all these things that could cause aggression. And um, I didn't hood and so there was no fear of hands. And again, this is not to say that this works with every bird and that this method is the way to train every bird because a lot of people do it a lot differently and have plenty of success. But this worked really well for me and Giselle, who was my first goshawk at the time. So that's the video about um, hunting and housing, pretty much. Um, right after hack, got into training, got to hunting. She took to it really well, and we've never looked back. And then the next video will be about how I tried to breed her, how I tried to artificially inseminate her unsuccessfully. Uh, but she did lay eggs. She did build a nest. We went through all the steps, and I ended up pulling a Cooper's Hawk uh, IS for her to raise so she could kind of finish having the whole experience. And that was a pretty cool experience. And so in the next video, I'll just talk about the, the attempt to breeding and her raising uh, baby Cooper's Hawk and how all that went. Thanks again for watching.